Okay, I am consenting. Yes, I am consenting to be recorded. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, uh, I will. Uh, well, first, I, I should say that uh, I've done a, a small fraction of the work I'm going to present. This is really uh, a work of the of the team in, in Montpellier. So the evolutionary and theoretical uh, experimental and theoretical evolution team. Um, and there will be little evolution of, uh, in this talk. It will mostly be about uh, epidemiology. And in fact, the, the tools that are going, I'm going to use will be quite simple. So uh, in a way, the, the, the talk will be more about uh, an evolutionary ecology team dragged into to the pandemic. Uh, and uh, we did get some support from the Occitanie region for, for this work, but that's, uh, that's all, the, all the support we, we were really able to, to get. Uh, before I start, I should, uh, I also always now give a, a word of context uh, about research in France, just to, to point out the, the dramatic situation of, a, of a French public research. This is a just a correlation between the, the number of positions per year uh, as a tenured researcher at the CNRS. And it's since uh, 99, and you see we've been losing 10 positions per year uh, on average. And unfortunately, uh, the, yeah, the, the fit is, is, uh, is, really, is really strong and, uh, and things are clearly not improving. And uh, I also mentioned this because there, there's part of a link and we can come back to this on, on how modeling uh, was uh, perceived uh, by the, the public authorities or, or science in general by, by the French uh, official um, government. Okay, uh, so my plan is to, to give a few words about what we did very early on, just like being confronted to the outbreak. And, uh, and some early work on phytodynamics and, and perhaps um, one of the important models we, we developed to, to try and address uh, public health questions. And then we'll see, perhaps uh, we'll have a vote or something. We, there, there are several aspects I can present. We, we did some more optimal control-based control uh, approaches, although, this is mostly the work from Ramses Jijudemas, so I might not be able to answer all your questions and details on that. Uh, we were involved in a project with uh, very detailed simulations, which could also be of interest, I think. And then we worked more recently on um, the variants, uh, trying to measure their advantage, their transmission advantage, and also looking at within host kinetics. So uh, we'll see. Um, We'll see which uh, which aspect um, I should present. Uh, by the way, please don't hesitate to to interrupt me. I, I, um, I won't really be able to follow the chat, but uh, yeah, just uh, feel free to, to to jump in at some point uh, if you want. Okay. So uh, I guess, like many of you, we, we were um, we were not working on SARS-CoV-2 in, in early this year. In fact, I think we. We really started thinking about it during um, a meeting a little bit similar to this, where, where we were having meetings of modelers in ecology and evolution of infectious diseases in, in Montpellier. And I think it was on March 9th or 12th, uh, it was a Thursday, where um, basically I said, perhaps we should talk about SARS-CoV-2. And it was interesting because a lot of the colleagues in ecology and evolution said, well, why would we do this? You know. Uh, uh, everybody in France is going to be modeling SARS-CoV-2 uh, in the next week. There's nothing really we can do. Turn, turns out that wasn't really the case. And uh, uh, so we, in the team, we started working on this right away, actually, right after this meeting. And, uh, and our, our first report, which was a basic estimation of epidemic growth, came out on, on March 14th. Uh, and I also mention it because it, it illustrates that data is really the limiting factor in this case. What can you do when you're in this situation? This is what the, the kind of data we had actually until this point. So given this audience, I don't need to tell you that here you see that th this is in the incidence. Uh, the red part is the stochastic phase. You sometimes see cases and then you don't see any case. And, and then at some point you see that every day you, you get something that looks more deterministic. 
uh, and this is the log scale. So clearly from this, you can calculate a doubling time, uh, the number of days it takes for the epidemic to double in size. It's just the, the slope here, the R divided by uh, long two. Uh, and with some additional information, you can also calculate the, the basic reproductive number, reproduction number, which is the average number of people uh, an infected person infects. And, uh, and this is what we did very early on. Uh, it's interesting to note that the serial interval, and I'll come back to, to, to what the serial interval is, was coming from data from, from Asia, paper by Nishiura et al. And the, the, the case, uh, the incidence data, was coming from uh, the website Our World in Data, which I think was getting it from the WHO. But uh, just to point that the, the data was very limited in France and, and through the French sources, we, we didn't really have access to, to, to anything. Uh, this I can skip because I, I think you all know about this, but it's just one of the why do this. Uh, and, and one of the very basic uses is that for the general public or even for medical doctors, just being able to show that the doubling time was three days was just a way to explain, for instance, when did the epidemic emerge? And, and for instance, uh, you see that with two months, you, you get 20 doublings with a doubling time of three days, and that's one million infections. So, so that was a way also to convey a message saying it, it was just impossible that this epidemic had been circulating in France in 2019 uh, at this speed. Uh, so just yeah, very basic, and, and you all know this uh, famous chess uh, story. Yeah. So basically, what is an exponential growth? Uh, to, to, to go in a bit more into details, this reproduction number is interesting because there are parallels with ecology. And I guess you've all heard the, the, the notion of all zero, how many people someone infects, but that's an average. And when, when you want to estimate it from, from real data, it becomes a bit more tricky. So. Uh, if we go a little bit more into the math, uh, what you want, to, what you want, well, what, what you will, what will happen is that um, each individual will cause a given number of infections every day of his or her infection. So overall, if you look for one infected individual, the individual reproduction number of this person is just summing all these beta i's, all the person it infected every day. From this, you can get a quantity that is very uh, important in, in uh, epidemic control, which is the generation time. Uh, and it's basically the distribution of when the transmissions occur. And, and this is a very important quantity because uh, if people infect uh, other people on the third day of their infection, it's not the same at all as they infect them uh, two weeks after the infection. And so based on this, uh, you can, uh, if what you look is the number of cases on, the, on day T, uh, well, what you know is that the number of cases you're observing at the current time on day T depends on how many cases there were at T minus one multiplied by this generation time. So uh, people who, who transmit on the first day of the infection plus people who transmit on the second day of the infection, et cetera, et cetera. And so here you see that depending on the incidence on the current day and on the incidence the day before, you obtain a relationship that involves this reproduction number. And you can also write this in a more compact form with, uh, again, your generation time uh, interval. Uh, and so overall, you, you obtain something that's much more heuristic in a way of estimating this reproduction number. And it's simply the number of cases you've observed on your day of interest divided by the incidence on the previous days weighted by the generation interval. And, and I, I go in, in this into details because uh, in the team, we're, we're more on the mathematical modeling than on the statistical modeling. And, and classically, we will define R0 or R from system of differential equations. But when you're confronted with data, and in fact, this is discrete data, which also complicates things, uh, you, you have to use different approximations and different tools. And, uh, and for the audience, there's a, there's a nice parallel uh, with ecology. And, and you see that if you assume uh, an asymptotic behavior, so basically an exponential growth uh, from this relationship, then you, you'll have uh, uh, basically the, the Euler-Lotka equation. So you'll be converging the R times the 
etc will be converging to one and uh, yeah this is just to show that the, 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 these methods are really rooted in population dynamics and ecology uh, what we did with this was to, to create a, a website which was online since um, uh, since April, where um, and it's still online. You, you can check it up. Uh, it's hosted by the French Bioinformatics Society now, um, where you can enter a country or for France you can enter a region or a department, and uh, it will calculate this R zero uh, using two different methods. I'm not going into the details. But um, but yeah, it, it's a way for the, the general public. And that, that was one of the first online tools to, to visualize R0, uh, or actually more the temporal reproduction number, how R0 changes over time. Uh, what we did very early on, the other type of data we could access, uh, thanks to the Gizade, Gizade, Gizade uh, consortium, which was created initially for influenza, there was um, early sharing of virus genomes. And uh, this is interesting uh, in the context of the field known as phylodynamics. Uh, the idea of phylodynamics is kind of summarized with this picture here. So here you, you have uh, what you call trajectories. Uh, so a population dynamics of an epidemic. This is the prevalence, the number of infected people and time goes from top to bottom. And there are three, these are three trajectories with the same parameters, but there's stochasticity, so you get different trajectories. And, and the, the tree on the right corresponds to the trajectory in black. And, and what, you, what you see is that uh, every time there is um, uh, a clearance, uh, every time the, the, the prevalence decreases, you have a leaf in the phylogeny. And on the contrary, every time there is a, an increase, there's a, a transmission, you get a branching. And so if, if, you, if you know this phylogeny, you can go back to the trajectory. You just need to sum, in a way, the, the number of leaves that are active at a given time. Um, but it's the other way around is not true. And, and for instance, you see that there's a bit of structure here. You see that this person infected this person, et cetera. You get these tiny clusters. And, and this you cannot deduce from the trajectory. So the short message is that there's more information in, in this uh, phylogeny. And a phylogeny is something we can infer from sequence data. And so the idea of phylodynamics is that from the sequence data via the phylogeny, you can make inferences about population dynamics. And more specifically, what you can do is date events. So date common ancestors, date when the virus entered a country. Uh, you can estimate the speed of spread, exponential growth rate, or even reproduction numbers. You can even estimate infection durations, especially using methods uh, developed by Tanya Stadler, uh, who's uh, at uh, ETH in, in Basel. And you can also detect spatial structure. Uh, this is uh, one of the most widely used methods. So it's Bayesian phylodynamics. It's based on a, uh, writing a likelihood function of observing your sequence data uh, given an underlying model. And what is very important is this function here, this transmission model. Uh, it's basically, uh, it, it will tell you what your, your likelihood is um, given uh, a phylogenetic tree to, uh, to that, well, uh, sorry, likelihood that uh, an epidemiological process with the parameters of interest generated the phylogenetic tree you observe. And, and so, Basically, from data, you can get a likelihood function of, uh, of parameters that relate to evolutionary dynamics, but also to epidemiological dynamics. And then there's a, a review by Denise Greenhurt on, on these methods. Uh, so uh, really nothing fancy. Again, I mean, uh, we, we just used published methods. What we did at the time was to, to, to collect the, the data that had been shared from France. You can see there's some sort of geographic structure. This is a, this is a, each color corresponds to a different region. Uh, you you can identify the French epidemic wave in the middle. Uh, you can date the epidemic wave, which is this big cluster here. So you see that the epidemic wave appears to have started at the end of January. And using these more fancy methods, I I was mentioning before, uh, we we could also estimate uh, the reproduction number. Uh, so here we did it with three time periods. Uh, this is uh, the initial spread of the of the infection of the of the epidemic. Uh, this is the reproduction number 
uh, during March, uh, or actually, no, sorry, uh, early March, so end of February, early March, and, and blue is really the, the month of March, and it's both before and after the lockdown. And what you see is that initially, uh, the prior uh, distribution is the dashed line. So what you infer in black is not very different from the prior. You, you, don't, you, you don't really know much. Uh, then you have the second time period, February, early March, where uh, here you're, very, well, you're quite different from the prior. And you see that the reproduction number is quite high, so very rapid growth. And then the third period, which includes as part of the lockdown, and you see that the, the R0 has decreased. So, it's one of the usage of uh, phylodynamics. Here, we didn't use any incidence data, only the sequence data. And the sequence data kind of reflects what you expect from the, from the epidemiology. And uh, with the same method, you can also estimate something that is kind of similar to the generation interval I was uh, presenting earlier on. So when do individuals transmit? Uh, this is our prior distribution in gray, and this is the posterior distribution. And we get a me median a peak of five days, which is a, uh, which is um, yeah, kind of um, consistent with uh, with estimates at the time. Okay, so very basic things, and and this again, we we could uh, we we published our report in early April, uh, but uh, we wanted to go to go further, and very quickly, the the big public health problem was being able to predict ICU admissions. So uh, the um, the hospitals, what they wanted to know were uh, how many beds they should plan. And, and this is what the data looks like. So uh, the, the triangles, this is the, the French public health data. These are the I, I, daily ICU admissions uh, in France. And in red, these were the hospital uh, deaths. Uh, it doesn't include the uh, aged care facilities. And here you see the lockdown started here. And so the, the goal is to find a model that, that's able to, to, to capture these dynamics. Early on, uh, this is the model we, we, we started working on in this very first meeting, and uh, we, we published a, a report on this in, in March. We used the, the time, types of approaches we use classically. So it's a variation of a, of a susceptible infected recovered model. So it's a set of ODEs. Susceptible hosts uh, are infected, but at first they don't have symptoms and they're not infectious. Then they become in, infectious and, and asymptomatic. And then some, some asymptomatic hosts um, uh, will have a mild infection. So they'll be infectious, but won't go to the hospital. And some of them are hospitalized. Uh, and, and the ones who are, are admitted to the hospital can either die or recover. So very naive approach. And the problem when you do this is that this is the, the kind of best fit you get. So I'm showing the data again and, and the curves are the best fit you can make with such a model. Uh, and the problem here is, is that uh, these models, these ODE-based models, they, they are very convenient because ODEs are, are beautiful mathematical objects. And, and if you're working on long-term evolution, they're, they're kind of OK. I mean, you're, if you're interested in a, in a long-term equilibrium, it's fine. But when you're interested in short-term term dynamics, when you really want to capture this trend, uh, the problem of the ODEs is that they are typically uh, what you call Markovian, which means that if an individual is uh, infected here, the probability that he or she clears the infection doesn't depend on how long he or she has moved to this um, class here. So there's no memory in the model. Uh, one of the reasons for, for having such a model was that we didn't have really any data. Uh, as I said, the, the hospital data was shared start they started sharing the hospital data on march 27th for the aged care facilities it was on april 2nd and and we had to wait until april 23rd uh before the the french public health institutes published the duration of stays in icu and uh once we had this uh we we could make uh, a more detailed model and and this is really the the work from uh, mircea sofonia uh, what he did was to keep the same structure. I mean, you, you can see that it's uh, it's quite similar, uh, susceptible hosts with mild infections or severe infections, uh, but, uh, and, and sorry, and severe infections go to the hospital, but there are two important differences. The first is that there's now a structure in time. And so even for mild infection, you're in, uh, sorry, I is the age, so there's an age structure. 
but there is also a temporal structure and you have a, a mild infection in the first day, in the second day, etc., and day, day G. And the same thing for severe infections, day one, day two, etc., day H. So every stage is structured in time. And uh, it, within the hospital, you see there are two uh, trajectories. There's a trajectory of people who go to ICU and who will always die. It's basically people who have been admitted too late in ICU. And then there are the more regular uh, course uh, of a hospital um, admission where people will either recover or die. Uh, the, the motivation, sorry, for, for having these two, um, these two trajectories within the hospital is again something we couldn't really have guessed. Actually, Mircea had guessed it uh, just a couple of days before they released the data. It was the only uh, obvious interpretation as to why our model was not fitting, is that uh, when you look at the data, you, you clearly see that uh, uh, a waiting time, this is uh, well, actually that's a different topic, but this is just to show the difference between the classical hypothesis from the, um, uh, from the Markovian model which will tell you when people are admitted to ICU after their infection. And this is what you obtain with a memory-based model assuming a viable distribution. And, and you see that it fits much more the, the real data. I'm sorry, I don't have the real data here, but um, you, you get a distribution that peaks around two weeks after infection. Uh, so, so when you introduce this structure and, and without adding many more parameters actually, um, you obtain fits that make, make much, much more sense. So you're really able to, to capture the, these short-term dynamics. I won't go into the fitting itself. It, it was a kind of a difficult to, 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 to get a, a fit that made sense from the statistical point of view. And the parameter estimates are, well, uh, nowadays not that interesting in themselves, but we, Mircea estimated an R0 of three. He could uh, date the origin of the epidemic wave estimate the effect of the first lockdown in France and, um, and the proportion of infected hosts. Uh, just to, as for the reproduction number before, one of the things we did with this model was to, to build a, um, a, a platform. In fact, perhaps I can use uh, um, the, um, the fact that we're on online to uh, show you more precisely what it means. Uh, will that work? I think you should be seeing my whole screen now. So yeah, so what, what we did was to, to use the, the structure of this model to build, yeah, there it is, um, uh, a short-term, uh, well, short-term forecasting and analysis of the epidemic in France. So uh, here you should be seeing the, the map of France. And, uh, and the originality of this tool is that it can also go to the departmental level, so below the regional level. And, uh, and uh, it's working only with the ICU admissions, but yeah, you, can, uh, you can see the trends and, and we do some, some slight forecasting for two weeks. And then you can also look at the current occupancy of, uh, of ICU beds. Uh, yeah, so this is for one of the French departments, for instance. Uh, and you, you, you get an estimate for zero, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we've also included the vaccine, vaccine coverage. And, and um, one of the great satisfactions is that we, we learned recently, for instance, that the, the PACA um, health authorities are here, uh, this is the tool they're using now to, to, to do some uh, planning at the local level, at the departmental level on uh, how many beds they, they, should, uh, they should plan in, in hospitals. So, um, so it's a, a direct application of, a, of, this, um, of this model. Okay, back to uh, the talk. Uh, so this is where, uh, yeah, I've been talking for a bit more than 20 minutes. I, I can, present some more stuff on uh, optimal control if you want, or uh, more on uh, simulations or variants. I don't know if you have a preference. As you want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'll, pre I'll, I'll choose then. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll present this one because it's, uh, I don't know. It's perhaps it's something I do less often, so it was 
kind of uh, impressive. So we, we've been, I, I was contacted by Olivier Tomin, uh, who at the time was working in the CERA near Paris. And he's a computer scientist. And, and basically he was coming to me because he, he, he had built for, for completely that something completely unrelated to, um, to epidemiology. He, he implemented an algorithm that can extract all the features from OpenStreetMaps. I don't know if you, you're familiar with OpenStreetMaps, but it's, a, it's kind of an open um, version of Google Maps. Uh, but it's, it's much more powerful. Well, first, you're not allowed to use Google Maps uh, for, for, for such a project. Uh, I'm not even sure you could collect the data. I'm not sure Google handles its data cleanly enough so that you could use it. Uh, but the other advantage of OpenStreetMaps is that in France, the, all the public information of the building structure, the cadastre, has been put into OpenStreetMap. So this means you, you can access all the details of the French spatial uh, building. And, and even when I say building, you know whether it's a school, a shop, etc. cetera, uh, within the whole of France. And so what Olivier did is that he, he found a way, apparently it's not trivial to extract all this information from OpenStreetMaps. And then with the help of Marc Barthélemy, who's a specialized in modeling human movement, he implemented uh, basically uh, mobility of agents on this, uh, on this map within France. So he used uh, demography data from France to, to first seed the country with uh, based on uh, based on our densities of populations, and then for everyone is a, basically everyone is assigned to a home, and then every day individuals can move. There, there's a rule basically uh, they visit from zero to three buildings, uh, besides their own building, and uh, there's a mobility kernel to say which building they visit, and so that's what he had, and he contacted me during the lockdown saying it. it could be used to potentially to, to model the, the spread of the infection. And so again, what we did was to uh, reuse Mircea's model. And so we, we um, added to this model an epidemiological level. And, uh, and so instead of just having people moving around, you had people or infected people. And for infected people, you, you have the same, um, the same thing as, as in Mircea's model. So you, you have the, uh, the generation time, and, and then some people can get hospitalized. And, uh, and the big difference being, of course, that you follow these people uh, within France. Uh, I forgot to say that in his simulations, he's simulating 60 million of individuals, indiv so individual based model with 60 million individuals. And uh, this is running, one run takes roughly two hours on a, on a regular computer. So it's, uh, I mean, in, in terms of programming, it's, uh, it's beautiful, it's beyond beautiful in terms of uh, computer science. Uh, this is what you get in terms of the results. So what, what we did uh, right now, I mean, he explored many scenarios, but uh, uh, one of the most interesting, I think, is just to, to consider an epidemic without any specific control. So, so here he seeded his epidemic. Uh, I think he seeded it. I mean, it, it starts from Paris, uh, but I think he might have seeded it at Google's headquarters in Paris or something like this, just for fun, uh, with uh, 20 individuals. And so you see the epidemic. So on the top, it's the national uh, epidemic. Uh, and uh, the, the purple, uh, sorry, the pink are the, the number of people uh, who are infected. And in blue, it's the estimate of the reproduction number. And in fact, you can calculate the reproduction number on the data, but since this is an individual based model, you can also measure the actual reproduction number. You can count how many people uh, one person infected. And, and so here we chose it so that initially you have an R0 of three, like you had in France. And so you see this first epidemic wave. Of course, there's no lockdown here, so it's an uncontrolled epidemic. But you see that the, the reproduction number drops quite fast, uh, and the first epidemic wave vanishes. And you see a second epidemic wave. Uh, and again, this is an absence of any lockdown. When you look at the regions, uh, you understand better what's, what happens with these two waves. And, and you see that you, you have a first wave, and this is the, the purple here is the Ile de France region near Paris, where the epidemic was seeded, which is one of the most dense uh, populations in France. Uh, 
so you so this is your first epidemic wave mostly and, and then you see that the second epidemic wave is a mixture of all the other regions and, and so you see how the geographic structure is creating these two waves you can go even further because uh, you can go to the level of the of the district, the canton in France, it's not the same as the Swiss canton, uh, and you can look at several summary statistics, but for instance, for, for each district, you see that th there's a nice correlation uh, between the, the distance from, from the origin from Paris and the time before the epidemic arrives. Uh, and you also see that the, the epidemic arrives faster here in areas that are more densely populated. And, in and even more striking, uh, th there's a big debate as to what is the, uh, the herd immunity threshold. So what proportion of the population has to be immune, either vaccinated or nat naturally infected to avoid disease spread. And, and what he finds is that this metric, uh, which kind of correlates with the final epidemic size, depends very strongly on, on the density. Here it's a metric that basically uh, says how many people you meet um, uh, on, a, on a given distance. Uh, and so the, the more you're on the right-hand side, the more you live in a densely populated area and you meet many people. And, and what you see is that there's clearly a relationship between the two where in very densely populated areas, uh, if you let an epidemic spread, spread without controlling it, uh, more than 80, 90% of the population will be infected, which is what theory predicts. But on the contrary, in, in uh, areas with, with less population, here the, this is a, the, the color gives you the density of the points. Uh, you see that if there are less, the, less people living there, in the end, on average, you, you get a, a very small final epidemic size. So it, it suggests that uh, the density is an important factor to, to take into account to, yeah, to, to forecast epidemic spread. And, and just, uh, and perhaps I'll conclude on on this, or I can talk about the variants if you want, but uh, we also looked a little bit in more details at the transmission chains, because again, this is an individual based simulation. So we know who infected whom. I, I actually have videos if you want, where you can see the, the transmission chains in France. And from these transmission chains, uh, what Olivier did was to recreate the distribution of, uh, of, in, of reproduction numbers. So how many people an infected person infects and that's what he's showing here. So there's two parameters. There's the mean of this distribution. The, the distribution is here. So you, here, secondary infections, uh, zero infections. So you infect nobody, you infect one, two, three, et cetera. And uh, he, this is, these are snapshots, uh, A, B, C, and D at different times. Um, and, and so uh, actually I forgot to say that uh, a lot of these outputs and the simulations were, were performed by Corentin Boenek and the team. And, and, and so if you follow the, the mean of the reproduction number, well, you find what you had before, which is that the mean is, is three, which makes sense. And then it decreases below one, that's the end of the first epidemic wave. And then you get the second epidemic wave. But what is very interesting is this dispersion parameter of the distribution, which you can interpret somehow as uh, the, the, um, the frequency of, a, of a so-called super spreaders. And you see that initially, you have a very dispersed distribution. So potentially uh, many, um, many super spreaders. And then as you go on, you, you see that um, the, the dispersion parameter uh, decreases. And, uh, and so super spreaders somehow play, uh, play less of a role in the epidemic. So you see that the distribution of the number of secondary infections varies with time and, uh, and potentially the, the importance of super spreaders vary with, with time. Um, yeah, so it's, um, it's again not, I mean, it's, it is population dynamics, it's not directly ecology and evolution, but obviously you, you could also uh, put a lot of ecology and evolution into this, for instance, by linking these transmission chains with phylogenies or, 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 um, or similar ideas. Um, I think we have time if you want to talk about the variants. Okay, so, um, uh, well, this one is a bit, uh, I mean, this one is very trivial because it, it, it's just calculating the variant advantage, how fast they spread in the population. The, the interesting thing uh, for, for, for our community is that 
the tools that are most appropriate to estimate this come from population genetics. And there's a, actually it's not et al, it's Luis Miguel Cheving, uh, who wrote a, a, a nice mini review on this in biology letters. And it's when you have a mutant in the population spreading, uh, assuming the transmission advantage, the selection uh, advantage of the, of, the, of the mutant is constant, uh you you can uh, you can calculate it uh because there's a nice trick and, and in fact the, the frequency of the um, of the mutant follows a logistic growth equation and uh and so this is uh, this is what we did with the variant in france and we could show um and we, put, we put the preprint in february that variants had a, a 40 percent transmission advantage in france and uh and more recently we redid this and showed that variants uh, these are now called beta and gamma uh, that were detected in South Africa and Brazil initially. They now, they, well, in April, they appeared to have a transmission advantage over the alpha variant that was detected in, in the UK. So it's, uh, I mean, it's interesting in public health, but it's also interesting that these are tools from ecology and evolution and really having a mutant spreading in a resident population. What is uh, perhaps um, more, well, not original, but uh, more seducing in a way, is what happens within the host. And, and this is work, well, both of this comes from a collaboration with um, the uh, CERBA laboratory, which is one of the big um, diagnostics laboratories in France, who were very enthusiastic in, in, uh, in, uh, in working with us on this topic. And uh, Baptiste Eli and the team, who's a, a PhD student, uh, did some beautiful analysis in a, in, a, in a very short amount of time. So basically what we did here, we've had access to the tests, mostly from people who, who, who get uh, screened in the general population. And for 8,000 of these people, we, we had at least two, two, two measuring points. And not only did we have this, but we knew whether they were infected by um, a wild type strain, uh, the alpha variant from, from the UK, or the beta and gamma variant. We cannot really distinguish between the two. So for, for the majority of these, we had two samples. The vast majority of these people were from the general population. We had a few samples from the hospital. And you see that the median follow-up time was eight days. So basically it's people who get tested twice uh, and um, a, a week um, with a, a week in, uh, of delay a week in between the two tests. Um, and most of these were in, in the Ile-de-France region. So th that's what the data looks like. And um, here it's the uh, zero is normalized and it's the, the day with the lowest CT value. And I'm going to explain what the CT value is. And then uh, it's the, the all the samples are, are um, ordered after this, depending on how many days after this uh, lowest CT value uh, they were performed. The CT is uh, the cycle threshold. It's um, it's a quantity. Those of you who, who did PCR uh, obviously know about this. You know the um, polymerase chain reaction is, is a chain reaction, like the name says. And uh, basically, you you have um, a target DNA that you're uh, you're trying to amplify. And the reaction, if if the target DNA is there, it will amplify it. And the, the trick is that there will then be the original DNA and a copy. And then these two can be amplified again. And so you go from one to two, from two to four, et cetera. And so then every cycle, you're doubling the, the amount of genetic material. And at some point, uh, you will say that the, the signal in the data, because you're, you're, you're using fluorescent uh, material, uh, at some point, you say that your signal is above the noise, above the threshold. And, and this is where you're sure that your target is there. In other words, the more of your target there is, the more quickly you will reach the, the threshold. Uh, on the contrary, if there's very little material, you'll have to do many cycles before you reach this fluorescence. Uh, in practice, uh, when you have a CT that's below 30, uh, you, you will consider that there's very little virus. And, and sometimes these tests will just be handled in as negative. And conversely, if you're above 20, you have really a lot of uh, virus. So here, this is why we take the, the sample with the lowest CT as somehow of a proxy for the virus load. Uh, and what you can see is that there's a general trend with a decrease. So uh, it makes sense. 
because uh, well the, the virus load increases really rapidly and then it decreases so uh, sorry the the scale is uh, reversed so it's an increase in ct over time which is consistent with a decrease in virus load uh, so the goal was to analyze this, and you see that there are different colors. So we had data for the wild type, for the alpha variant, or beta gamma. So 40,000 tests performed uh, between February 8th and March 20th, 2021, uh, over, um, uh, over 8,000 individuals. Uh, so what Baptiste did was to use a, a linear mixed model, which is kind of the same as a linear model, but there's the mixed here. Uh, so you have your, you want to explain your, your CT value, which is the proxy for virus loads. So you're trying to explain this with several factors, the age of the person, the strain, of course, the day of the infection, uh, the sampling date, uh, the region where the sample was acquired and whether the sample was coming from a hospital or not. Uh, you have interactions. And uh, we also had a random effect. That's why it was uh, mixed uh, in the name. Uh, basically, this the random effect is for the patient, the individual, and, and it's because um, by definition you have multiple samples from the same person, and people vary uh, between one another for other reasons than age or, or all these. And, and so, to improve the power of the test, you, you can say that for each individual there's some random noise, but all the samples from the same individual should have this noise going out in the same direction. Uh, so, uh, and, and for this, I mean, there are lots of packages to, to do that. We tried all the models and selected the one that, that had the lowest um, BIC information criterion. Uh, so, so that's what the best model looks like. Uh, what you see is that in the main effects, there's an effect of beta and gamma. So the, the beta and gamma variant appear to have a lower CT, so a higher peak virus load. Uh, there's an effect of the sample coming from a hospital. Again, the, the CT tends to be lower if the sample comes from the hospital, which kind of makes sense because <clears throat> people, the most severe infections tend to have higher virus load. Uh, the age was not significant. Um, there's uh, one effect of the region and the sampling date. I can come back to this if you want. Uh, there was an interaction for the alpha variant with the age in the strain. So you again see this decrease. So what it means is that the peak virus load appears to be higher for the alpha variant, but it is dependent on age. So if you're younger, it's not really strong, but if you're older, then uh, the alpha variant has an even lower CT. And then we get to the interesting stuff, which is the interaction between the day and the strain. Uh, and so here there's a negative interaction. So it means that the slope of, uh, of, of the decrease in, in CT is slower, sorry, of the increase in CT is, is smaller for V1. So in other words, the, the decrease in the virus load appears to be slower for V1, for the alpha variant. So alpha is the one that was detected in the UK. And, and you also see an effect of the hospital and the age of the patient going in the same direction. Uh, th this is just to, to show uh, a little bit what happened with a different approach. It's a survival analysis because the, the previous approach doesn't really account for temporal correlation issues. Uh, and, and so here it's the probability of uh, still being infectious. So being a, here defined as a, having a, a CT smaller than 30. And the, the pink curve is the, the hospitalized patients. And so you see that the slope here is, uh, is much um, decreased. So they stay infectious for, uh, I think it's 1.7 days. But you also see that with the alpha V1 variant uh, in blue, you also have a significant difference than the wild type. And, uh, and I think it's 0 0.7 days uh, that um, of, of added infection. Uh, what Baptiste did then from this was to, to try and, and get a, an epidemiological idea of what this meant, this, uh, this longer infection and this higher virus load in general. And so for this, what he did was to, to go back to this generation interval or serial interval, if you want. So when do people transmit? And, and what he said, what he did was to do a mapping between the decrease in, the, in, in this generation interval and the decrease in virus load. And, and when you do the two, this is what it looks like. So here, that's the CT value. So uh, the CT is going to increase over time. So the virus load decreases. And this is the daily infectivity that you get from a generation interval. And well, 
I've seen worse linear fits than this one. I mean, 95% uh, for the adjusted R square. Um, so, so, so there really seems to be a, a, an almost linear relationship between the CT and the infectivity uh, at a given day. And it kind of makes sense because uh, there, I mean, there aren't many papers, but there's at least one paper from Spain that showed that people who have higher virus load or higher CTs are, are more infectious. And they found that there was kind of a log relationship between the virus load and the infectiousness. And, uh, and, and well, we know there's, a, there's also a log relationship between CT and virus load. So finding a linear relationship is not absurd. So uh, we know what the CTs are. We know what the difference in kinetics in CTs is between a variant infection and a wild type infection. And so then what Baptiste did was just to um, say, uh, integrate over all the CT values of an infection uses, using this infectivity to see how the different, actually, uh, if, you, if you just imagine kinetics here, how the difference in kinetics translate into the transmission potential. And this is what is shown here. So it's the transmission advantage, and this time at the epidemiological level compared to the wild type based on this relationship between CT and infectivity. And the, the nice feature I, I find out of this relationship, so in, in green, it's the V1 or alpha variant from the UK. Um, so sure, you, well, you, you see that for France, it's around 40%, actually, which is quite similar to what we had from the epidemiological data. But you also see that there's a difference between country. And, and that, that relates to the age-specific effect I was mentioning before. And you see that the V1 variant appears to, to, to have an even greater advantage in countries where the um, average age is, uh, or the age pyramid is uh, more skewed toward older ages than in countries with uh, younger people. And in Niger, for instance, the V1 variant, or the transmission advantage of the V1 variant is, is much reduced compared to Japan. Quite interestingly, also for the V2 and V3 variant, it's kind of the opposite. There's a slight trend, although I'm not sure it's significant, uh, with an improved transmission advantage in younger countries. Okay, so for the variant-specific kinetics, we found that V1 and V2, V3, which are now named alpha and beta gamma, appear to have higher peak virus load than the wild type, with a correlation with H for alpha. And uh, V1 or alpha, appears to be causing longer infection than the wild type. And this was obtained, I mean, it's, it, it's really, it's very basic statistical modeling. It's a really a linear mixed model. Uh, and then when we put some more uh, fancy calculations into it, we can try and uh, estimate or approximate the transmission advantage. And well, first we find it's kind of consistent with what we got from the epidemiological data. And we also see that the transmission advantage could depend on the on the demography of the population. Uh, so I'll, I'll think I'll I'll I'll, I'll, um, I'll stop here. I mean, just as a conclusion, it's uh, I guess to this audience, it's really not uh, it's a, an, an obvious take home message, but it's really the the importance of, of modeling and in infectious disease, and especially in public health, and, and the three main points. To, to us, uh, the ones we, we try to insist on in the team is to describe the epidemic, because people who will tell you that they work without models is, is always uh, complete nonsense. There's always a model from, from even the moment you start conceiving how the things could be unfolding or, or you want to present something, there is a model. Uh, and the models are also obviously very important to understand what's going on, uh, especially interactions between, uh, between processes or exponential growth. And finally, if you want to make predictions, although uh, you, you won't really be able to make any robust prediction beyond two weeks, but still, uh, this is, um, this is um, yeah, the three main interests of modeling. And if you want, we, we can come back to, to, to the interactions between model groups and, and public health officials in, in the discussion. But uh, I think I've been, uh, I've been already quite uh, uh, chatty, so perhaps I'll... I'll I'll stop here and thanks again for the invitation and um, and thanks again to, to all the team. Again, uh, my, my part in all this is uh, is is very um, it's quite limited. Thank you. So.
uh, I think we can 